Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 56, Treasure Hunt, the search for rare out-of-print games. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and as always, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of gameplay, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9.30 Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Now today for our main topic, we're talking about finding rare and out-of-print games. After that, we're going to talk about Sorcerer for a bit and then get into some Extra Life warm-up wrap-up. Lots of gameplay to talk about with Extra Life in the mix, so let's get started. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, or maybe some gaming discussions that we've been a part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can hit us up on social media, uh, everywhere, on the web, pretty much any site, any gaming site, any social media site, Tabletop Bellhop, one word. So getting to that feedback, I got to say, it looks like people really dug us digging into RPGs a bit last week, because, man, we got a lot of feedback on both the podcast and the blog post. And I'm only going to share a small part of just some of the feedback we got in this past week. Uh, first, I got Phil Hatfield wrote on MeWe to say, I'm prepping to run two one-shot RPGs at a game convention in October. Defriant and an apropos article. Well, thanks, Phil. Now, Dan Homer commented, solid article. Then he also adds, you probably won't get to vent the group, so brace yourself for problem players. Chaotic stupid can be more prevalent <laughs> in one-shots when players don't have the same investment that they would in a campaign. Also, immature players whose parents want somewhere at the con to drop their kids off for a few hours. Bringing in a ringer player or two beforehand can help guide a potentially dysfunctional group. With more complex systems especially, keep character abilities simple with all references ready for players. And be prepared for ambient noise, especially at a con where you need to shout to be heard. This can be pretty taxing for several hours, so have drinks or even lozenges at the ready. Well, thanks for the additional tips, Dan. Um, there's a lot to break down there, but right now I just want to talk about his first suggestion about not being able to vet players ahead of time and possible problem players. Uh, this is the reason we really pushed and talked about that pre-session chat, right? That, that session zero, even though you're playing that day. I really think it's important to use tools like CATS to make sure everyone is on the same page. Once, once things get started, if someone is heading off track, remind them the pregame discussion and the fact that everyone agreed on things like tone and setting before you actually get the game rolling. Now, one of the things that was interesting, you talked about getting loud. Um, when we were at Breakout, sorry, Queen City Conquest, they actually had something I'd never seen before, which is a fact where people, if the room was getting too loud, would put their hands above their head. And if you notice someone else with their hands above their head, you stop and put your hands above the head. And eventually everyone has their hands above their head and the entire room quiets down. Once that's happened, everyone starts playing again. That quick reset actually works really well to reset the tone down low so that everyone else is talking at a lower rate. Because it just uh, ramps up during a con, right? Everyone talking over top of everyone else and it gets louder and louder. Now, Michael Wolf commented, I'm surprised the biggest day of the character's life never occurred to me in putting together narratives for games. But it really is that heroic moment for all the characters. Well, thanks for commenting, Michael. We're all the heroes in our own narratives, so make it a good one. Now, Chris Groff a few, had a few other co uh, considerations for running con games that he can think of. For some players, this may be the first time they have given a game system and or a can setting. Try and showcase what makes that setting, system or setting cool. If you're running a D&D game in Dragonlance, then bring in elements of Dragonlance that are unique. If you're running a Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, bring out those elements that make that system iconic beyond just using percentiles. 
Try and make sure that all the players get equal time to participate. I really think this point is key, especially at a con. It can be very easy to let some player run the table and hog the spotlight. So make a conscious effort to involve players that aren't as forthcoming. It can be as simple as asking leading questions to a shy player, try and draw them in, but don't make the assumption that quiet players aren't having fun. Basically, it's a bit of a juggling act of personalities, mm -hmm. but by keeping everyone engaged and providing equal opportunities should keep everyone interested. Now, how are we doing? About halfway in, 90 minutes or so, depending on your session, take a pause just to see how players are feeling, how they are feeling about the rules or the setting. Are there certain elements they are enjoying and want to play up or downplay? Uh, <clears throat> Mo already mentioned it, but I think it's important enough to highlight it. Action. If things are bogging down or players mm -hmm. can't decide on a course of action, throw something at them. Keep <clears throat> things moving. Active players are happy players. But one last thing. Don't be afraid to give running a con game a shot. It's okay to be nervous. You'll be nervous. Some players will be nervous. It's normal and okay. Everyone is there to have fun. Don't sweat the small stuff. If you make a mistake, roll with it. It's all okay. Once things get moving, they just tend to work out. There's a ton of great advice there from Chris. Thank you very much for that. Uh, scene time is one of the topics I actually considered covering in the article, but I figured I'd said enough on the topic at that point. I really like the how we are doing, how are we doing check-in. Uh, that's a fantastic idea, especially me midway through the, the con game. That's a cool idea. And I got to say, Chris is right. Don't be scared of running public play games or any games, even games at home. Game mastery may look difficult, and it's not as hard as it looks like it is. And you only get better by doing it. Now, Emmett O'Brien commented. I forget where. I think it was on MeWe. Uh, when talking about the X card in Lines and Veils, I like to mention spiders was mentioned example a lot of the time it seems to trigger the idea that these don't have to be life or death issues that seems to reduce the tension in calling out subjects well thanks Emmett. so very true you never know what a trigger for someone might be from a tiny bug to a nuclear holocaust now ryan mcray writes that is a fantastic article mo thanks for sharing and i'm going to dig into your site can i share this article on my newsletter Thanks, Ryan. And of course, you can share this article. Um, Ryan's article is the Burn the Tavern Down newsletter, which you can check out at burnthetaverndown.com. All one word. If anyone else wants to check it out, feel free. Head over there. Um, I didn't subscribe in time to actually see my own content, so I'm not sure exactly what he put in about the article, but I did give him permission to share it. I now get Burn the Tavern Down in my weekly inbox. Now, Michael J. Malone writes, great article, Mo. I look forward to one day having my own experience at a con. Someday. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Well, thanks, Michael. Good luck, and I hope you can find the time for a great experience. Now, finally, we've got a long comment from Kurt Covert, the owner of Smirk and Dagger Games, who had some comments about your initial thoughts on Tower mm -hmm. of Madness last week. Kurt is both the publisher and designer of Tower of Madness. Now, he writes, regarding the Tower of Madness, it sounds like you may not be distributing the marbles well in the tower, leading to no drops and mega drops. So try an alternate way to load the tower. Place the bottom half tentacles first, drop in half the marbles, then the top tentacles and the rest of the marbles. Otherwise, it's likely your tentacle pulling strategy. You don't want to avoid marbles. So unlike regular Kerplunk, don't pull out tentacles in layers. The wise strategy is to pull out from all throughout the game for a controlled fall. Give those thing a try, things a try and see how it impacts play. Uh, first off, I gotta say, it is awesome that Kurt sent this comment. Because from the comment, it's obvious he actually took the time to read the article, the actual review, which is great to see. Because a lot of um, companies I've seen just seem to boost your content. And you have no idea if they actually read it or not. This is obvious that Kurt took the time to read it. Plus that he had some constructive criticism on how we are approaching the game with some suggestions on how to have more fun with it, which I really appreciate. Thumbs up to Chris and Kurt, sorry, Kurt and Smirk and Dagger Games on that. Now, as for his actual suggestions for Tower of Madness, we'll get to how well those worked later in the show. 
That's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We record here live Wednesday nights at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, we continue the show after the Double Bell and an Awful Books after show. So, people are already talking about, uh, well, mostly food from before the show. Then we had a uh, slight interruption that uh, our moderator was uh, delightful enough to take care of. Thank you for that, uh, Angie Games. Yep, yeah, and... Uh... Danielle was talking about one of the things she would X card out or lines and veil in a game, which is clowns. There is one that I I know I've run a couple at least chill horror games with a theme park in them. So that would be a great example of when things like cats and the X card would come into great use that isn't all about rape or post-traumatic stress disorder or torture. Now, today we're going to be talking about shopping for hard-to-find games. And what I want to know from the lobby is if any of you in there know any great sites for finding rare stuff that I don't already know about. So we're going to come back and check in after I've given my list of resources to see if you've got something I don't know about. Well, as always, we'll be back stopping in the lobby a few more times throughout the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Our social media works too. As mentioned earlier, we are everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way to get questions to me is to go through the website. That way they don't get mixed. Missed, sorry, not mixed. Uh, they, well, I guess they could get mixed. I could get confused. On the website, they're in separate emails. But anyway, I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today's topic comes from Canadian game designer Todd Crapper, who writes, I'm looking for an older, out-of-print game, Atlantic Star. I was wondering if you knew a place I could get this, or a place that sells older, out-of-print games like this. Well, thanks for the question, Todd. Uh, listeners may recognize Todd's name for one or more of our Con Recap episodes. Todd is the man behind Broken Ruler Games and the role-playing game High Plains Samurai. Now, one of the things that I often get flack for um, on our show, on Twitter, on social media, is that we recommend some great sounding games. And then when people go to try to get them, they can't find them because they're out of print or impossible to find at a reasonable price. Uh, this happens more often uh, than I would like to admit, because at first I didn't even realize I was doing this, right? I would sit down and I would get a, what's the great next step game from Catan or something. And I would just start answering it. I'll be like, okay, here's all the games I think are great next step games from Catan. It wouldn't be until after I published the post that someone would point out that every single game I mentioned on the list was out of print and sells for over $300 on Amazon. And I got to admit, I feel bad about that because here I'm just like trying to share these great games that I played and I didn't think of it. Like, I have it downstairs. To me, it's just a game. Go grab it. Um, I don't like getting people all excited about a game, only for them to not be able to actually play it themselves. So as time has gone on, I'm much more aware of the current print status of the games I recommend. Now, I'm still going to recommend some out-of-print games. That's not going to change. But I do make sure that I include at least some more modern in-print games whenever we do a recommendation list. Well, we've never wanted to be the new hotness, it's nice if we can avoid being the old priceless. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, we're, our entire show is hidden gem games to make you jealous that uh, I have them and you don't. Yeah, it's not the point at all. Now, the thing, though, is that some of the best games ever made are out of print for whatever reason. Now, this could be the publisher loses a license. This one's actually extremely common. Or the designers passed away. Sadly, that does happen. We recently lost um, Mr. Loomis of Flying Buffalo Games just last week. Um, art files or other assets get lost. Companies fail. Kickstarters overpromise and can't fulfill. Really, any number of other reasons could come up. And when a good game goes out of print, they quickly become hard to find and often become rather expensive due to this scarcity. So what we're going to talk about today are some sources I've found to find out-of-print tabletop games. Plus, I'm going to actually try to find a good price on Atlantic Star. Yep. Now, I'm sure a lot of gamers out there, particularly some of those who love some of the older classics, have their preferred ways already. So if we miss something or you know a better way, mm -hmm. let us know in the comments or chat room and we'll pass on those tips to the listeners as well. 
Plus, I'm just curious myself. There's some Grail games I've been looking for for a long time that I've yet to find a good price on. So I'm interested in finding a copy of Ghostbusters 2 International, the box set. If anyone's got a good source for that one, I would love to know. The first place I always check when looking for an out-of-print game, especially board games, um, RPGs works as well, but that is at Board Game Geek, but specifically the geek market. Now, we did an entire episode on trying to navigate Board Game Geek, and we've mentioned it multiple times in the show, and we often know how poor the interface is, how difficult that site is to use. Now, they just relaunched the site with a brand new look, and I got to say, some of the stuff the site offers is still not really evident. I was actually on BGG for years before I even discovered they had a geek market. Like, they have their own storefront. I knew that was there, and you can go there and get cheap promo items and add-ons and merch. But I had no clue that they had this place called the Geek Market, where you can actually, users of the site can buy and sell. It took me years to discover that. Yeah, not only that, but simply by managing your collection on Board Game Geek, they make it really easy to look for people selling the games that you have marked as wanting, rather than just randomly sorting mm -hmm. through a list of four thousand plus pages of listings now the geek market itself i think is done pretty well it's a it's a public marketplace where users can list items for sale and other users can find those items and get in contact with the seller uh it's completely free to use like bgg doesn't take any portion of the proceeds or any excuse me or anything like that and it includes all the usual storefront stuff shopping cards shipping calculators search categories filters and so on Basically, all the stuff you'd expect to find in a good online store. The only difference here is that you're not buying from a store, you're buying from other users on BoardGameGeek. Now, sometimes those users are actually stores, but most of the times items on BoardGameGeek I've noticed are actual gamers looking to sell copies of their games. And there are a ton of items up for sale at a given time. And I got to say, popular games are pretty much there all the time. Like if it's current in print, you can probably find a used copy on the geek market. Or even if it's a Kickstarter or something that just came out at Gen Con, you're going to be able to find it. Now, collectible games are also often there, but they're usually at collectible prices. Now, rare out of print stuff does show up now and then. And it's worth checking back often to see if anyone's selling your Grail game. Now, I wouldn't rank their filtering system quite as robust as some. But the ability to search by your own wanted list means that you can avoid the problem I had of looking for, like mm -hmm. new listings of Canadian available games with Canadian shipping and Canadian dollars, <laughs> and finding uh, about 640 games yeah. available. You can't really complain about the selection. Now, the Geek Market does include a feedback system. Um, this is policed by users, though, not by Board Game Geek itself. So this is the usual when you're using a site like this, buyer beware, right? The thing, though, is this isn't eBay, right? You are on Board Game Geek with other geeks, generally alpha gamers, and the Board Game Geek people, um, the people who like to police that site are very vehement about it. We'll put it that way. And they're very good at keeping people honest and fair on the site, basically by really calling out anyone who's a bad actor. Overall, I gotta say, it's it's a really solid place to buy games, um, both new hotness, hard to find items. One of the things I've noticed is everything I bought on there is an immaculate shape and usually comes in better shape than if you bought it new. Everything I bought comes with card sleeves, uh, component upgrades, or a box insert included, like people who are selling on the site are proud to sell these games to other gamers and take good care of their stuff. In general, again, there could be people out there that are just going to toss everything in the box and sell it to you. Now, just try and be focused or you'll get lost in the weeds quickly. And then finally, unlike eBay, expect to pay for shipping. Mm -hmm. Generally, the buyer is the one expected to pay for shipping on Board Game Geek. It's just how it goes. Yeah, the only time you'll see it where it's not is if it's a store selling. And then usually the price are so inflated it's not working. So then I did take a look at the geek for Atlantic Star. I see Danielle is actually doing the same. Uh, at the time, I saw eight new copies for sale. The average price was about 30 bucks. Um, there were a couple used copies. There was one as low as five euro. Now, I don't know what the shipping would be at that point. Now, one of the best sources to find hard to find out of print games that is not Board Game Geek and is an actual store is Noble Night Games. Now, their motto is where the out of print is available again. And it's a fitting model because they have by far the best selection of out of print games on the web. 
It's pretty much a one-stop shop for rare and hard-to-find games. This includes both board games and RPGs. The thing is, with that selection and the amount of stock they have, Noble Knight may have everything you want, but you may not want to pay the price they're looking for. Uh, unfortunately, it's hard to blame them. When you're taking on such a major niche, and especially one that can have some real storage costs that will add up mm -hmm. over time, they have to keep their lights on. I mean, boxes not only get to, need to be stored on a shelf, but you need to have some level of environmental control as well. You can't just throw it in some outdoor locker and, and leave it. Yeah, and everything's actually bagged and boarded as well, at least for like RPG modules. They make sure everything's bagged, boarded, and graded. So right. they do. They take care of the stuff, and that costs money. Now, looking for Todd's game, um, Atlantic Star at Noble Knight. I did see it, but they want $52 before shipping, and that's for a used copy. Cavis Emptor. Now, if you are worried about getting a new sealed copy of the Out of Print game or, uh, you're looking for, check Board Game Co. One word. Board Game Co. All one word. They have a large section of, as they term it, heavily discounted games. And they are at a wide variety of quality levels. Like, this reminds me of when you go shopping on a bookstore site with all your different fair, good, and make sure you read up what the different things mean because you want to make sure you're trying to get a complete game, right? Now, to me, the selection at Board Game Co. Uh, never seemed to be quite as extensive as Noble Knight. The prices, though, are way better. Um, and when they do have a game, they tend to have multiple copies of each game, and they often have them at different quality levels. So say you're looking for... Egizia, you might be able to see Egizia, new, mint, and fair quality, all at different prices. Uh, another thing that gives them a bit of a step up on some of the other sites is they do offer free shipping on orders over 100 bucks, And flat rate shipping, even if you don't spend that, is only $9.99 in the U.S. Well, it's sad, but these days shipping dealies, deals can really make or break a sale, especially for those of us up here in Canada with Noah Han Solo mm -hmm. to cross the borders for us. Yeah, I did stick to mostly U.S. prices for this. Uh, I am in Canada. Some of these prices, and I know Todd's also in Canada. So some of these prices I'm quoting may be a little worse for him. I just know that most of our listeners and viewers are in the States, so I just figured it'd be simpler to stick to U.S. Plus, most of the good sites are in the U.S., Noble Knights in the U.S. There doesn't seem to be a Canadian equivalent, unfortunately. Uh, as far as Atlantic Star for Todd, it's only 1874 at Board Game Co., and it's listed in very good condition and complete. And that's looking like one of the best deals we've come across so far. Yeah, because you just add in that $9.99 shipping, except, again, that's to the U.S., so I don't know what they would charge to ship it to Ottawa. Uh, now, I hate recommending Facebook. I really do, because I'm not... I, I have such a love-hate relationship with that site and kind of, like, wish more people didn't use it and use something else. But I have to admit, the Facebook marketplace has become a great place to find games in your area because um, the marketplace is ge uh, ge geographically located and people can set up themed stores basically it's themed marketplace brighton windsor we have two that are great for finding board games one's the buy and sell for geeks group set up by a friend of mine and there's another one called the windsor board game buy sell group both of these have been great for actually for me getting rid of games as well as finding stuff that i couldn't find all the time now, along with the Facebook marketplaces, you can also find people listing games for sale on their personal page or in groups. But what I find even more useful on Facebook is you find one of those massive groups with tens of thousands of people in it and jump into it and just be like, hey, is anyone selling a copy of this? I'm looking for it. That seems to work really well. Now, unlike BoardGameGeek, there is much less vetting on Facebook and the potential mm -hmm. for being scammed is much higher. Now, luckily, there are some great people out there as well. So as long as you take your time and do some due diligence, you can keep yourself safe. Don't rush in for the fastest deal, though. Yeah. Also, many of the people on Facebook are willing to negotiate. You may be able to get prices lower than what you first see. At least trying to sell my games, every person who contacts me tries to get a better deal. So I have to assume many sellers out there are willing to reduce their prices. I now go with listing my stuff higher than I expect to get for it just so I can go down a bit because it seems to be so common. Uh, now, we mentioned Facebook, but there is other social media, right? Like, I got a long out-of-print RPG box set for, like, nothing on Twitter. Basically, I just paid shipping, and all I did was I went on Twitter and went, man, I've always wanted X box set. And someone's like, hey, I've got that. If you send me shipping, I'll send it to you. 
I've had the same thing happen actually back on G+. That's how I got the Buck Rogers role-playing game. Uh, then there's your local Kijiji, Craigslist, buy and sell type sites. Um, I personally haven't had any luck with this, but I do know other people who've gotten lucky and found games on the such sites. Now, a general note for any users of Kijiji or online swap markets in general. Take advantage of resources available in your mm -hmm. area for exchanging goods and services safely. Many places now, including police precincts, mm -hmm. have set up safe, monitored areas for exchanging goods where you can be sure you're safe. You just don't know what you're going to run into if you drop by someone's random house. Yeah, that was something I saw the last time we were downtown Windsor, that Windsor, outside the police station downtown, there is a, I forget what they called it, but a, a place for exchanging goods, which I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, now, I did go on Facebook. Um, I did try to find a copy of Atlantic Star. I didn't have much luck, but I didn't go on any like Ottawa trading groups or anything like that. And in general, most of the time, you're going to put a I'm looking for and I wasn't going to set that up before the show today. So I wasn't able to find a copy for Todd on Facebook or any other social media at this point. Now, here's a great one. If you go to conventions or have a large local game group, right? If you're in Toronto and the Toronto Area Board Game Society is around, you know, you've got a, a large group and those are math trades. Now, this is something else I discovered on Board Game Geek. Since joining the site, I've noticed that pretty much every con that's going to have 20 or more people, someone sets up a math trade. Now, a math trade is a trade between a whole bunch of people at once. It uses an algorithm where you go, I have these games for sale and I'm willing to accept these games. And it's a lot more complicated than that because you can rank things and you can add bonus items and all this other stuff. But basically a piece of software decides who should trade with whom. And it's set up so that you not only get games you want, you also maximize the chances of getting rid of something you don't want and having a trade happen. So it's just a really simple math trade between Sean, Deanna, and I, and I no longer want Sorcerer, and Deanna wants Sorcerer, but Sean wants Terraforming Mars. I don't have it, but Deanna does. But then I want DC Deck Builders, so I give mine to Deanna. Deanna gives hers to Sean. Sean gives his to me. That's a uber simple math trade. Think of doing that with hundreds of people. Yeah, this is a very geek-worthy concept, but it really isn't something you can, know, you can do with only a few people. Yeah. The math won't work out, because, and it works with that power of math behind it. And yeah. the larger numbers, the easier it is for all, all that math to work out. Yeah. Now, math trades, as I mentioned, are usually done at cons. Uh, the other thing you can always watch for is almost every game convention I've ever been to has at least one vendor who has rare out-of-print games. It just seems to be a thing. There's always that that one booth that has, has the rare stuff or the out-of-print stuff. You go to Origins, there's many of them. Um, if you go to the Game Science booth, man, if you want the old school pamphlet style role-playing books that Sean and I own a few of, you can actually get those there, which is pretty cool. The other thing to watch for is auctions. Uh, very few cons I've gone to. I don't hit a lot of cons, but they usually have some form of auction and auctions often include rare gaming goods. Yeah. So uh, next up, we've got uh, the big players. Yeah. Uh, Third-party sellers on Amazon. Amazon itself does not sell out-of-print games. Realize that. Realize if you're buying an out-of-print game on Amazon, you're not getting it from Amazon. It's going to be coming from a third-party seller. Uh, Amazon's a great place to find out-of-print games, but, man, these third-party sellers usually want way too many from them. I do, from what I hear, actually, someone like bots that price around and get uh, artificially inflated is the word I'm looking for. But it's worth looking, right? Over the years, I've found a few. Uh, for example, I managed to get a copy of West End Games Star Wars for $2.50. And it was in mint new condition. This is a book from the 80s. Uh, most of the time, though, these sellers are asking way too much for games. Um, and they seem to think their stuff's way more rare than it is. Sometimes they are that rare, but man, the price is still nuts. For example, right now, you can go to Amazon.ca. Todd, you could do this right now. Go there and pay $120.85 Canadian and get your copy of Atlantic Star. Or 50 bucks on the U.S. store. As always, Canadians get the short end of the pricing stick. <laughs> we do. And that's without shipping that $50 U.S. You got to toss that in there, too. So the other big boy, of course, is eBay. At one time, this was the place I would go to find out of print stuff. To me, that's what eBay was for, really, to be honest. When it first opened, that's what I did, is I looked up all the games I wanted as a kid or RPG supplements I couldn't find and tried to get them. 
I gotta say, not so much anymore. Like I, I personally have had many bad, bad transactions. Um, shopping around for the right price can take just way too much patience sometimes. Uh, and then when you do find it, you often get sniped in the last 30 seconds, which is just frustrating. Um, if there is one game you are looking for, what I, it, it's probably worth setting up a save search. And then just turn on email notifications and ignore eBay until you get that notification. Uh, as always, with eBay, I think anyone that's used it, it's been around long enough, make sure you check the seller's feedback. There's the whole buyer's beware thing going on and i've got to say i bought a few like new games and they were i not like new and man any more on ebay watch that shipping cost yeah make sure pictures of everything are there if you don't see a picture of it don't assume it's there mm -hmm. or even in good condition uh, i've had great luck with ebay for various things over the year but rarely by looking almost always it's been by setting up a notification mm -hmm. and walking away uh, and then when that perfect thing shows up at the right price, you go in and you do all your research on that, uh, seller and decide whether or not you're going to put in and then put in your bid. Yep. No, I agree. The other thing too is, um, I, w I don't trust anyone that says the game's complete. I have them list the components because I have had many complete games show up and then they don't have like the dice. And then the person's like, well, no, I didn't say it has the dice. You obviously have dice. I'm like, yeah, but this is a game with a die with a ghost on one side of it. I want that die and so on. Uh, overall, I'm not a huge fan of eBay. I got to admit, over the, it, my, my opinion on it has changed. Now, taking a look right now, I do see one copy of Atlantic Star for sale. It's coming direct from Germany, sure. Uh, it's only $26.99 US, though. But then you got to toss on 20 bucks shipping. Now, uh, D in the chat room is mentioning, watch out for stock photos. Mm -hmm. These are often warning uh, signs for, especially for used equipment. The other one to watch for, which is now becoming, unfortunately, more and more common, is counterfeit items. There is not a copy of Splendor that has wooden chips instead of poker chips in the game, but you'll find many copies for $10.99 on eBay right now. That is becoming more and more of a problem, unfortunately. So here's one most people wouldn't think of, and you're going to have mixed results on this. This is a site called Abe Books, A-B-E Books. It's a site that aggregates sales from a huge number of used bookstores. Now, it's mostly books, as you'd expect, but you can sometimes find board games on there as well. Now, overall, Abe's very hit or miss, especially for board games. Like, I have found some great deals, and then I found an imprint game selling for $3,000. It is worth taking a look at Abe, though. It's it's always interesting how some of these sites come up with their prices. Yeah. Sometimes you have to wonder if they didn't ask their brother and he said, oh, yeah, it's out of print. You can charge whatever you want for it. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. Now, for Abe Books, though, where I find that site really shines is when you're looking for role-playing books, RPG books, uh, hardcovers, softcovers, and so on. I have gotten some great prices on out-of-print RPGs. Uh, most of my West End Game Star Wars collection comes from Abe Books. Now, I did look for Atlantic Star. I had no luck whatsoever. There is a... Okay, so Atlantic Star is a board game put out by Queen Games. Well, I guess Atlantic Star was, uh, I I don't have it open in front of me, but there's something tying a boat called the Atlantic Star with the Queen. So when you search Queen Atlantic Star, you get, I think it was 600 pages of this one book and a book. So it might have been in there if I dug deep enough, but after about page five, I gave up. Yeah, Atlantic Star is actually uh, based off of a show, something in the a historical shipping yeah. uh, adventure. And so there are lots of books about that same topic. Yes. Not surprisingly. <laughs> Not at all. Now, this doesn't help Todd or his quest for Atlantic Star, but since I mentioned outprint print role-playing games and we're talking about how to find hard-to-find stuff, and I know that there are enough of you out there who are just as much a fan of role-playing games, if not more than board games, there are a couple more options. Now, the first one, though, and this is one that sometimes baffles me, is check to see if the game is actually out of print, especially with drive through RPG. Now, drive through RPG is a place most people think of to go get PDFs, right? Digital copies of books. But they offer print on demand on many of their products. 
And many of these rare out of print games aren't really out of print anymore. Like you can go to Drive Through RPG right now and buy a soft cover version of S1 Tomb of Horrors for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons for $9.99. Like you're getting the a print module right now. Like it's amazing how many times I'll see someone online bemoaning the fact that this game they want, oh my god, I really want Earth in second edition, they should reprint that. Only to find out that if you go to Drive Through RPG, you can buy it in print right now. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's unfortunate, but again, our RPGs are a, are a different sort of beast in many cases because at least with RPGs, it really is just words on a page, yeah, and a little easier to deal with than having you know that special six sided die with a dice on mm -hmm. one side. Very true. Now I know some people are collectors, right? I'm saying go buy a brand new copy of Tomb of Horrors. Well, you want that original printing of Tomb of Horrors from 1970, whatever, and you want it to have the old blue map in it and everything. I get it. I totally do. I was a collector. I still kind of am. I push away from that now. Uh, in that case, you want to check out Wayne's books. Uh, Wayne doesn't have the selection of a site like Noble Knight, but the prices tend to be better. And he offers free shipping at $50 US and has a ridiculously impressive collection of out of print role playing games, especially if you're leaning towards the big games like Dungeon Dragons, Cyberpunk, um, Castles and Crusades, right? The, stu the stuff from the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And then, again, RPGs, another benefit they have is they don't take up as much mm -hmm. space uh, and are. Depending on how you uh, how you store them, a little less environmentally sensitive than a big box of cardboard generally is. Yep, very true. Uh, another site I was able to find that I haven't actually tried was Dragon's Trove. They seem to be really good for new and out of print role playing games. Now I've actually not used them myself. And if you're in the UK, I got a lot of recommendations for the Shop on the Borderlands. Uh, I think it was Grognard Files, the podcast, that first opened my eyes to them. But I have heard about them many times from UK RPG fans. So that's also worth checking out. So that's pretty much it, right? There, there's my treasure map of sites I check when trying to find out of print games. Those are my, uh, Abe's probably the one most people wouldn't have heard of, but I hope I've given you some ideas of some new places to look. And I hope Todd, I found you a good price on Atlantic Star. All right. Well, let's check back into the lobby to see if they know of any other places to check when searching for your grail game. Uh, we've had uh, a few people picking up stuff uh, that were just sort of finding things just slightly ahead of you in the list yeah. <laughs> on, uh, on Board Game Geek and stuff. Uh, Tech was pointing out that uh, he actually asked this same question a few months ago and you answered him about Atlantic Star even. Did I? I must have answered <laughs> him directly. Yeah. That's kind of funny. It is a, a 2002 Spiel des Jahres winner, I think. So right. I got to admit, while looking for the game, I'm like, huh, an old 2002 Queen game. It looks pretty good. I, I know what I should do. I, I, I like Todd, right? I should buy a copy and bring it with me next year to uh, Breakout Con and give it to Todd. It'd be like, here, I found you a good price on it. If he hasn't already went and shopped and found a copy himself. There we go. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where Canadians just have it rough. Um, now, one of the nice things about board games, and you and I were talking about earlier in the day, mm. is that language doesn't always matter as much. Uh, yeah. From the pictures I was looking at, the German mm. version of Atlantic Star is just as playable as yes. the English version. You don't get the instructions, but it's all pretty obvious, uh, and you're just dealing with uh, a few various uh, mm -hmm. you know, conversions from dollars to marks. Not even that, too. Like, if you go on Board Game Geek, you can usually find English versions of games that are only in German. So, for example, the first time I played Wallenstein, Neil, who's actually going to come up later in the show, interestingly enough, uh, had gotten a copy of Wallenstein, this amazing Cube Tower game from Dirk Hen, same person who made Atlantic Star. Wow. Hey, we're all synchronicity right now. It's messing with my head. So, anyway, I uh, had gotten a copy of of Wallenstein, and I got to play it, and I, I fell in love with it, right? I've mentioned many times, I love Wallenstein, Shogun, that whole Cube Tower thing. But when I played Neil's copy, he had gone online, printed off copies of all of the cards in English, and glued it over top of his German cards. So he took the components and just glued the English over top, because he's not a collector, he just wanted to play the game. So first time I played this game, everything was in German. And one of the things that's really difficult in that game is pronouncing the names of all the cities, right? So we're like Uber Scuba. News, news we're in and we're doing all this stuff right so when the north american one came out i actually thought it'd be easier no they kept all the german names <laughs> which makes sense because their names of cities in germany but it was just like wow okay i thought the english version would be a little easier to play no it's not but 
literally he made the game 100% playable. And Board Game Geek is great for that, right? Yeah. If there's a game that's only in one language, you're going to be able to get the English translation there. And if you don't want to be, if you're, if you're cringing at the thought of gluing things down, sleeves yeah. work just as well. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't actually have to destroy your copy of a, of a classic board game, because I know there are mm -hmm. probably people out there who are just cringing in horror at the <laughs> idea of gluing uh, down English you versions do you on top. Do. And uh, there's also things like, uh, we talked about drive through RPG, there's also drive through cards. And for pretty much any game that has cards, someone has made the pattern for those cards to be able to print yourself in other languages, uh, which is also used for other things. Like one of the things I thought was brilliant use of drive through cards is someone had made p money for Power Grid because Power Grid has some of the worst paper money in the market and everyone knows that. And they made card versions, which I thought was cool. Right. Now, yeah, to help out the Canadians, I do have one Canadian site. The problem was uh, their selection, they didn't don't have a selection in my opinion it's boardgames.ca does have a used game section and it's kind of impressive but like you're, you can just browse through it there's that little there right they have stock ticker international oil man um trivial pursuit pop culture klondike scribbage uh polyectomy poly economy which is a canadian game you'll see at every thrift store you'll ever go in in canada you will find a copy of this game it's the board game of canada supposedly Every time I've been in one, uh, you've got the worst case scenario survival game, Last Chance, Star Trek seen it like it's it's balderdash. But there are 150 used board games available here. But like, I don't see anything most hobby gamers are going to want, but yeah. probably worth checking out. And again, boardgames.ca is a really good grab of a <laughs> URL for what is really just an FLGS in Alberta. Yes. Yep, <laughs> it really so, is. You know, they're just you're they're just an FLGS. Um, yeah, that happens to also buy used games. It looks like from their local value village, yep. and I'm sure they probably get some dropped off from some of their 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 locals. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, again, it's it's worth checking out your local yeah. FLGSs to see if they've got anything. Uh, you know, if it's your Grail game, it may not happen. But if you're just looking to uh, you know pick up something a little gently used. You might get lucky. I got to admit, that is one thing I wish the local game stores did was um, commissions the wrong word. What do you call that? Where you, you give them the item and they sell it for you and take consignment. a percentage. Consignment. Consignment. Thank you. I yeah. wish our local stores sold used games on consignment. I've suggested it to them multiple times. I don't see what they're losing by doing it. You've been in the store. There's lots of room there. It's not like it's going to take up a space that could uh, be with other inventory. Realistically, consignment is a uh, accounting management problem. Nah. Uh, it's, you know, the only, it doesn't, it, the, if you're a consignment store, it's great. Cause your entire business right. is that way. But if you're not a consignment store, it's a little more problem too. I guess so. I, I just wish I, I have games I would get rid of and I like buying used games. I like saving yeah. money on games. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. So that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email, recaps all the content we've released in the week previous. <coughs> Excuse me, blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, or anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Oh, whoa, mute, you're muted. You coughed and didn't unmute. Oh, thank you. I <laughs> hit it, but it mustn't have hit it hard enough. As of today, you have exactly one week left to enter to win a copy of Zentico. As of right now, we've only got 400 entries. That's pretty great odds. Head over to the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Click on reviews. There you'll find my review of this abstract strategy game called Zentico. Under the review, you'll see a widget where you can enter to win. 
Now, for those of you listening to us via our podcast, you got one day left to enter because this comes out on Tuesday and it's going to end midnight on Wednesday, technically midnight on Thursday. But 11.59 and 59 seconds on Thursday is when it's going to end. Um, you got one day left to enter. Use the code rolled up to get five bonus entries. And for those of you here live in the chat room on Twitch, I've just typed out another five entry code into the chat room. And thanks and good luck to everyone who enters. Now, we're trying something new on YouTube. Starting with last week's episode, we're now releasing sections of our podcast onto YouTube mm -hmm. as separate shorter vid videos. We're looking to try and hit that short, you know, under 20 minutes uh, or, or tighter market that uh, seems to exist on YouTube for people who don't want to sit through an entire hour and 20 minute show and just want to catch up on some of the specifics within our broadcast. Yeah, part of this was uh, we're sitting there thinking about the fact that someone might want to listen to the show to hear where to find out of print board games. Someone else might want to listen to the show to hear my opinions on Tower of Madness. And then someone else might want to hear what we play every week. And they might not be the same person. And people aren't necessarily going to want to have to filter through the stuff they don't want to hear to get to the stuff they do. But for now, we are going to release the full podcast still on YouTube. Now, if we notice it's not really getting any views, we may drop that. Uh, what I want to know, for those of you listening and those of you in the chat room, is if you do have an opinion on this. If you are going to prefer to consume our media broken up into segments, or if you'd still like us to keep it all together. Uh, we're testing this out for now. We'll see how it goes. And we're going to adapt to how we see, basically, the, the view show on YouTube for the next couple weeks. Now, this past weekend was our Extra Life warm-up event, and i got to say it went rather well. Uh, we'll be talking about the games that were played in our Tabletop Gaming Weekly segment up next. But what I do want to do now is announce the next step in the road to Extra Life 2019. Come level up with Extra Life at uh, the CG Realm on September 24th. Now, this is going to be our big RPG event. Remember, role-playing games are tabletop games, too. Tabletop games aren't just board games, and we want to highlight that here in Windsor. Uh, this is going to be a big game day in no... in a, uh, Sorry, big RPG event leading up to the big game day in November. We're going to have two seating sessions and multiple games being run at each session. The first session will run from noon until 4 p.m., and the second will run from 6 p.m. till 10 p.m. So that is uh, two four-hour sessions of role-playing games. You're welcome to sign up for a game at each session. Now, in between, there's a little two-hour break there. It's going to be time for people to get some food, give the DMs a break, GMs a break. Uh, we're also going to be hosting an RPG book exchange, which is a great chance to get rid of some of those old game books you no longer use and pick up some new games. The cost will be $5 a session and a $2 buy-in for the game exchange. 100% of this money goes to Extra Life. Would love to see any of you locals out for that day. And even if you're from out of town, hopefully this is enough time to get you in. All right. And now... And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take this look back at the games we played and the events we attended and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. So as I just mentioned, this past weekend was our Extra Life, uh, was the Extra Life Tabletop Appreciation Day. And we considered this our, our Extra Life warm-up day because we're going to be doing the big thing on November 2nd and 3rd. But we also want to take part in Tabletop Appreciation Day. So we were at the CG Realm on Saturday uh, for a full 12 hours. But first, we actually played some Sorcerer 3 player the night before the event. Both? Tori and Kat were out of town camping, so Bloomhaven was off. But I was heading down to Windsor for the Extra Life event, so we took this chance to check out and live stream Sorcerer from White Wizard Games. Three player with the bellhop Deanna and I. With three players, uh, we've talked about Sorcerer before. With three players, there is a special mode you have to use. It's, it's called Battle Royal. Um, this mode can be played with three or more players, up to six players. Though there's only actually enough components in the box to play with four, with a core box. If you want to play five or six, you have to buy a second box or some of the expansion packs, which should be in stores, actually, I think, this weekend. Now, Battle Royal, you're still fighting over zones of London, but the battle zones are placed between each player. 
and players can only interact with the zones on their left and right, which actually reminds me quite a bit of uh, Between Two Cities from Stonemaier Games. Yeah, the setup was straightforward enough, though the play order for resolving battles was non-trivial yeah. to keep it balanced, and it would have benefited from a marker of some sort to help us keep track of the, the turn order in that way. Yeah, we might have to, to go with the uh, drunk board gamers and paint a rock with an arrow on it the next time we play. Um, now, what happens with this game is you're still fighting over the battlefields, but instead of winning a battlefield and it getting destroyed, instead it resets. So all minions at the location are destroyed on both sides of the field. Uh, the zone resets to full health, and the player who won the zone gets one point. And the first player to three points wins the overall match between the three of us. Or if you were playing six, it would be the same thing. First player to three points. I guess overall it went pretty well. Um, Sean, you seem to pick up pretty good, uh, pick up the game pretty quick. I don't remember any rule problems, though, like you said, it did take us a bit to get those three-player battle timing down. Yeah. I don't even know if we quite had it by the <laughs> end. Now, I got caught making one mistake that would have made a big difference between Deanna and I, but I don't think ultimately it would have changed yeah. the end game result at that point. It was late enough in the game. Now, I do think you picked up the game quick because of your experience with like Magic the Gathering. I think that's because you've played those dueling era or Keyforge or those other dueling games. I think that really helps with being able to grasp Sorcerer. Yeah. Now, having played a handful of times now myself at different player counts, I got to say that it felt a little weird with three players. Uh, for one, there's really no reason to move your troops. Like, I couldn't see any point in moving my troops. Um, and flying was literally useless. So I have a bunch of guys in one of the decks that cost more than they can fly. And that means nothing. Um, it also means the rally action never got used because why would you move your troops? But really, like, those were kind of minor. The biggest problem, though, that I had while playing, and I think you guys experienced it as well, was the downtime the overall game length. Because with three players, whenever two players are resolving one of the battlefields, the other player literally has nothing to do. Now, they probably care who wins, but you can't influence the battle at all. It's not like you could spend your omen tokens to cause people to re-roll and stuff like that. Now, I guess I don't think it was terrible downtime, but it did mean, at least the game we were playing, that that third player tended to pick up their phone and start doing something else. I can only imagine how bad that could be, though, with four, five, or six players. I, I completely agree. The game dragged some. And even when editing the video for tomorrow's YouTube release, yeah. I found myself speeding up some sections because there was just nothing really happening, you know, between, and if one person's thinking and sitting, uh, thinking about their team, then the other two people are doing mm -hmm. nothing and there's nothing going on. Yeah, like there's so, literally nothing to do. Yeah. And like I say, you care. Like you're like, eh, I care. But if you are a fourth player, like, you wouldn't care at all what that person across the table is doing, or five or six. It's like playing Seven Wonders, where you only worry about the player on your left and your right, right? Well, when the battle's going on the other end of the table, I don't know. Now, as for the overall game length, I, it took us three hours to play a three-player game. Now, that's more than twice as long as our usual two-player games, player games have been taking. Now, I do have to admit, Deanna said the same thing. It didn't really feel like it took that long, so I guess that's good. Like, the game's engaging enough that we didn't really notice the hours pa passing, but just for a, that style of game, right, the dueling card game, I, I think fast-paced. And I got to say, I can think of other three-player, three-hour games I'd rather play, or two one-and-a-half-hour games I could play in that same time. And, and I think part of the reason that this game wasn't as painful was that the three of us just don't get to sit down and play any games that yeah. often. Uh, if we were playing together every week, I don't know if it would have been as bearable <laughs> to have uh, sat through for that for three weeks. I could see that. Now, at this point, I got to say, I, I can't recommend Sorcerer at three players. And I'm sorry to say I'm not really interested in, in ever trying Battle Royal with four or five or six. Like, no, I, I'll turn that down. Even for review purposes, I, don't, I, I can tell you it's not going to be good. I got to say, though, like this is I'm, I'm fashion on sorcery here, but actually overall, though, I still really do like the game. I think it's a fantastic two player game. And I even liked it playing teams, which was cool. But just no, not three. I, I think I've had enough of that. Yeah, absolutely. The lack of focus and ease of distraction when some of it just doesn't matter to you. Uh, yeah. The lack of importance of some of the basic gaming elements like flying just makes this an irrelevant game mode to me. I can't see 
the purpose of it. I mean, I, I understand that they wanted to have a larger group format, but uh, unfortunately, I think you've got a really solid two or team player game. Mm. Stick with it. Hide the fact that you, you tried this Battle Royale mode. And if I remember the last time we talked about Sorcerer and you'd looked it up on Board Game Geek, I think the, the majority of players seem to agree with us on this one as well. Yeah, they call it two-player only. They don't even mention it higher, and probably because of the Battle Royale, and, and mm. the team is just considered two-player, basically. Yeah, Deanna's saying right in the chat right now, too, it's, it did overstay its welcome. Like, it was per, fun for the first third. Okay, I didn't think it was quite that bad. I would say about <laughs> half of it. But So, as I mentioned at the top of the segment, and the segment before this past Saturday was our Extra Life charity gaming event, our first one, our first step on the road to Extra Life, or our first stop, I guess, on our road to Extra Life. Uh, we were at the CG Realm, all three of us, and we gamed for 12 hours straight, probably a little bit more than that, if you count setup and not. Uh, Sean was down. We streamed the entire thing on our Twitch stream. We sold baked goods and coffee, kindly donated by the Coffee Exchange. Cheat jars were out. Uh, things seemed to go good, and we raised over 200 bucks. Now, while we didn't get a large group checking in online, it was good to see a face here and there mm -hmm. checking in as much of what we were uh, as much of what we were doing was testing ideas and methods for the big stream in November. Yeah, which I think we're still going to go forward with. That's something we, we talked about wondering, like, because we did. We had viewers throughout the day, but we didn't have a big rush of people. Uh, as for the physical event and the store that day, the crowd was a good mix. Uh, there was a mix of regulars and new gamers. I'm especially happy to see the new gamers. That's something that, that I, I love to see. Uh, plus, it's good for the store, good for the event. Um, I got to sit down to a bunch of local gamers I hadn't met before, which actually doesn't happen that often. Um, I tend to know most of them. There was some new people there, which was cool. And I got to say, I think the event overall, even if we didn't raise the money we were hoping to, I think it was great for getting the word out about the other events. And almost everyone I talked to had looked at the roadmaps we had on the table and were getting excited about future events. Like I had people saying, you know, I took the day off work for this and I'm already booked off work for November now. So I think that was the, the big win for this event. Yeah, there are a number of other events. So be sure to check out the Road to Extra Life details, both here checking in with uh, uh, the podcast mm -hmm. and on the websites, both tabletopbellhop.com and windsorextralife.com as we move towards November. Now, getting to some actual games I played, um, we started off the event, Ryan Percy was there, and man, he was begging me to play Tower of Madness, and I really wanted to show off Tower of Madness. Now, if you remember from our announcement section back at the top of the show, Kurt Covert had some tips for me to try the next time I played the game, so I made sure to use these when we play, and I gotta say, well, I, of course he knows what he's talking about, it's his game, but they did make a difference. Uh, I've now finally seen a game where a player's gone insane. I've even seen a game where two players have gone insane. I've seen people use the insanity cards, and I've actually seen it where players are converting spells into discoveries and turning the spells into points. And I've even had a game where the players won instead of Cthulhu destroying the world. This one got played a few times over the weekend, and it was fun to watch people sitting down around it and just sort of enjoying the, the theme and the, and the components of the game. Yeah, it's definitely still the table presence on that game. I swear everyone that walked in the store walked by that table and took a quick look at that game. Gameplay was better. It definitely was. Uh, the biggest tip I found based on Kurt's words were to tell players to draw tentacles from all over the place. Don't try to play safe. You don't want to remove the bottom layer and have nothing happen. Because uh, that's what's going to happen. The way you see the marbles is they're sitting on the top ones. Um, you want to make sure you start near the top in the middle uh, the one thing we did notice over the game is, man, if you want a mar lot of marbles to find the diagonal, horrors seem to hold up the most marbles. Pulling those out almost always resulted in either uh, marbles falling or at least a shift in the marbles. Uh, though the one thing that I was surprised didn't help, that I really thought it would because I tried this twice, was taking the green marbles, which are the Cthulhu ones, and putting them in last. I really thought that would make it so the green didn't come out first, and man, they were some of the first to fall. So that that was the one time I did that. It, right away, those fell out. It was a very short game. Sometimes, madness is determined to settle in. Cthulhu will always succeed. <laughs> I gotta say, overall, Tower of Madness is more fun when players aren't playing it safe. Um, but there's still the one aspect I am not a fan of. Uh, Deanna is the one that pointed this out the first time, still feels this way, is that when you succeed, 
in an investigation, but don't have a high enough discovery total. Like that's just boring. Like, like you win, right? Because you succeeded, but you get nothing. Like it, it's like the most boring state. It's almost as bad as like a miss a turn. Like, yeah, you got to roll the dice, but you get nothing for it. You don't get any points. You don't get to do the fun thing and pull tentacles. I, I really starting to think, like I was thinking about if I designed this game, what I'd tweak. And what I would do is I would have the locations be worth two point totals and like say 10 points for the pr primary investigator and every other investigator who succeeded would get like four. Now that would require some more components and doesn't quite work with the game as it's published, but at least you get something and it would turn the whole area control. It would turn the location cards into an area control game. Yeah. I think it seems to be a somewhat general agreement that while enjoyable to sit down with, the game has some minor balance issues that can frustrate some harder core gamers and lend this to, from being something that may be a little more flash in the pan or, or, or entry gamer and not uh, long term. Uh, to be honest, like the game is is basically built on a gimmick, right? It's Kerplunk with Cthulhu, and I, it's going to appeal to certain people. There were people who loved it, like absolutely loved it. They were the Cthulhu fans, the people who like silly, take that style games, which, you know what? It's Smirk and Dagger. That's what Smirk and Dagger is all about. That is their brand, are the, the cutthroat, stab your opponent in the back type of games. And that's that is aspects to it. This isn't the kind of game for heavy gamers, and I got to admit, I lead towards the heavy side. Now, the next game I played on Saturday was a four-player game of Dead Man's Cabal from Pandasaurus Games. Uh, this was a game with three experienced players, one brand new player. Uh, I, every time I talk about this game, I'm going to be talking about the Oracle, because that is the big thing with this game. I did the best I could to explain how important the Oracle was. Uh, I pointed out players didn't want to use up their cubes when buying runes. I gave hints. Uh, about how to win the game. Despite all that, I got to say, like, uh, th this was a landslide victory for me. And I don't think I'm actually all that good. I just don't think I quite expressed well enough how well, how, uh, how scoring works. Like, I slaughtered everyone. Like, one of the players didn't break 100 points, and I had in the mid 200s. Yeah, I really have to say, though, this game displays so well. And you didn't even use the dungeon interconnect to. No to really sort of bring it all together. Uh, it was still an eye catcher on the table. It was really hard not to walk by this game and go, <laughs> ooh, what's that? Yeah, we ended up moving the camera partway through just to stream it because we figured it probably better for people to watch than just a whole game room. Now, for me, this was my best play yet. Like, I destroyed everyone, yes, but, like, that is also the, my highest personal score because, man, the, the scoring system is opaque. Like, it is, it's not clear. Like, it takes some games to learn. And I got to say, for me, it's finally starting to click. Right. This is the first game where I actually had some synergy going with which skulls I was collecting, which skulls my guests required and which skulls I was trying to score through the Oracle. Like in the end, I had 24 skulls left over that scored the maximum amount through the Oracle. Like that was 120 of my points there. Now, I think we've mentioned that when teaching games, it's a good idea not to baby your players, but it also isn't recommended to wipe the floor yeah. with them. I wasn't even trying. Like, like I was trying to win, but, like, I didn't even know until for final scoring I was doing that much better. I got to admit, like, I, I kind of felt bad. But, like, really what this reinforced to me is just how hard to grasp that Oracle scoring is. Like, some of the most opaque of two scoring I've seen in any game so far. Like, it really doesn't make sense until you played more than once like you almost have to play a game like I'm, I'm trying to think of how i can better explain it like i verbally i've gotten it down to i think as clear as i can get it out like i'm thinking maybe the next time i play i'm gonna make it so the game ends sooner and make it so you only play until like take half the players cubes away just so they can see it i don't know because like that that the oracle thing's almost a mini game in itself and speaking of mini games i thought this was uh pretty appropriate one of the players Ryan, who was the first time he played it, felt that the entire game actually felt like playing three or four different mini games at once while still trying to keep track of an overall goal, which was the Oracle. And I got to say, that's, that's a pretty good description of how your brain has to work to play Dead Man's Cabal well. Overall, I do. I, I, it seems like I'm saying a lot of negative here, but I do dig the game. But man, that obscure requires system mastery to do well level makes me worry that in this era of one and done board gaming where people play a game once and then move on to the next thing, I don't know if Dead Man's Cabal is going to be around much longer. 
I have a feeling it's going to get left in the dust just because it doesn't have that big wow factor the first time you play. Well, I think for some, the unique and amusing theme might keep it going for some time. But without that buy-in, I agree. It's in a crowded space right now with its weight. It's a three out of five and its playtime of 90 minutes to 120 minutes. That is a very, very crowded and competitive space right now for games. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of them out there. And, you know, if it's not, if, if you don't have that, uh, oh, I love the look of it, mm -hmm. you know, why go back to it? It just doesn't have that initial bang, right? Like, uh, it's it's really hard to sell any game on the market right now. It's like, you've got to play it three times to really enjoy it. Why would I play this three times when I could play three new games, right? Yeah, like, that's, 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 that's kind of the hours, mentality. Right? You know, it's, you know, you've, you have six hours of your life to learn the game. Yeah. That's, that's a tough... Uh, now, I got to admit, I like it. I think it's worth learning, but I like those style of games. Weight three is a nice, good minimum for me to really enjoy a game. Uh, speaking of heavy games and games with high weight, I was really pleased to see Neil Hilmar out at the event Saturday. Now, he's one of the locals that really digs heavy games. Like, he's he's the military war gamer, the guy that's into 6 to 12 hour Euros. Um, he likes his heavy games, and it was cool to see him out to a public event. Because he's one of those gamers who sticks to his regular game group that tends to get together Saturday nights. Neil brought a bunch of games, um, of which we decided to play Teo to walk in because he had the hot new expansion, the late pre-classic period. Now, I played my copy of Teo to walk in a handful of times, uh, including teaching it at Queen City Conquest. I'm a big fan of the base game, but I've been curious about this expansion because I saw it at Origins and I wasn't allowed to touch it, which was kind of frustrating. And I really wanted to see these new components. This is one of those games Mo can't keep himself away from. After all, it's got rondelles. Yes, it does. And it adds something else I love, which I'll get to in one minute. Uh, the late pre-classic period comes with a bunch of modules. Uh, it's, people call this a spiritual successor to Zolkin because it's the same designer, similar theme. Interestingly, the expansion for Zolkin is very similar to the expansion for this and adds very similar types of modules. It seems like something the game designer likes. The main thing, one of the biggest things that this expansion adds are tribes or gods. As far as, I, I haven't read the rules. Uh, Deanna thought you were picking a god. Personally, I thought you were picking a tribe that worshipped a god. But whatever it is, you get a tile, you're going to pick a tribe to play, and this gives you some form of player benefit as well as some penalty. Now, the one I played let me take two actions every time I ascended a worker. But every time I wanted to go up on a god track, I had to play extra cacao. Now, Neil had something where he could use other players' dice on the production spots, but he had to pay extra whenever building the temple. Now, what these tribes add is something everyone should know by now I love, and that is asymmetry. Yeah. So this expansion is not all or nothing. You yep. can pick and choose what you want to add into your game, which I think, especially for this particular game, mm -hmm. is a really important detail. Very true. Yeah, all of these are separate modules. And I'm probably going to miss some of them. Because, again, I didn't read it. Neil set it up. Uh, as far as I know, he threw everything into the pot. Um, the second one, or second module or whatever we used, was two new worker placement spots. And what it replaced were the original spots for building the temple and painting the steps, which were a huge part of the base game. What these did was change it so the value of your dice that land on the space matter, which is a big difference because before all that mattered was your number of dice. And you now have to have higher dice in order to build the upper levels of the temple. Now, what I liked about this is it slowed the game down because every game I have played at the base game ends because the temple gets built, not because the time runs out. So it was cool that this new board made it less likely to happen, that the game could be rushed to the end by a player who just focuses on the temple. Yeah, now I think slow down is a key term in what that expansion did. This is already a thinky game. Yeah. And the expansion, very clearly, from my mm -hmm. external point of view, did nothing to speed up what is already a longer game. Yeah, if anything else, you could probably check this on Board Game Geek while I'm talking, but I am going to guess that it upped the weight of the game, not reduced it. This was not a streamline, make the game faster. This was definitely more options, more choices, more control over your destiny, which I made it for a longer game. Yeah, as I, I seem to remember that the uh, there isn't enough details yet on yeah, okay. uh, late pre-classic pre to uh, um, to really give it uh, oh actually no sorry yeah, it's a weight of 4 on, yeah uh, so that's higher yeah that's so it's a 3.72 3 
three point yeah. seven two for the uh, Teo Tawakin and a three point and a four for yeah. uh, Late Breed Classic. Once you get up to four on Board Game Geek, your 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 smoke's coming out your ears, <laughs> <laughs> and it was like that. So one of the other things that these new boards did uh, was a lot of the actions let you unlock locked dice. Now, this I thought was a great addition. Now, this is something that did speed it up a bit. Because in the original die, locking a die was powerful but painful. Because you have to pay three cacao, which cacao is your money in the game, and it's very tight. Or you had to literally skip a turn to unlock your guys, which that kind of sucked. Now locking dice is actually more viable. So I dig that. And unlocking is less painful, and actually that does speed up the game if you're not taking those missed turns. Now, the last large addition that pre-classic period added was a new god track. So in the original game, there's three gods. This adds a new orange god. And then this one was funky because if you went up the track, you got like technologies or powers. You you had ways you could break the rules. And I got to say, they seemed extremely powerful. Now, Neil really took advantage of this track. Like, he had played multiple times, and he just raced up this thing. Deanna and I, I got to admit, I, I don't know if she intentionally ignored it or it just happened. We both didn't even touch that track. It just, for me, it was just, there was too much other new stuff going on. And, oh, yeah, new stuff, seasonal events. That was something else that happened. Because every eclipse, you flip the tile, and again, the game rules were broken sometimes. So one of them, we flipped it over, and we could pay extra cacao to go up the god tracks quicker which sucked for the god I was playing because I already had to pay extra cacao to go up the tracks anyway, and I could never afford it. And actually, I think that's kind of what lost me the game, was not adapting to that seasonal change well, because it really screwed me over. Um, another season, we didn't have to pay cacao for our own dice, which was great, but we kept forgetting that we didn't have to pay for it. Uh, the events were okay. Uh, eh, they, they, they were kind of neat, I guess. The boards, though, I, I liked. They, they, they definitely had more impact. And I got to say, there's there was other stuff. I'm sure there were. I'm sure there were new discovery tiles. There were probably new technology tiles. I, as I said, I've only played my base game a handful of times. So I wasn't going to recognize what was new and what was from the original. Overall, though, I got to say, I liked, liked what I saw. Um, everyone listening knows how much I dig asymmetry. So adding that in, big thumbs up. That That is a rule. If I own that module, I would never not use. If I own the expansion, I would never not use that module. Um, I did really dig the replacement building and plant painting tiles. I do like it. The fact that high level dice mattered more and it made the game was no longer who can finish the temple first. So that was a nice change. As for the other stuff, it seems solid. Um, I know next game, I definitely pay more attention to that orange temple. Now, and that was just one table of what was going yeah. on at the extra life event. Elsewhere, we had architects of the West Kingdom, mm -hmm. Wingspan, Terraforming Mars, Hour of Madness getting played pretty constantly. Yeah. Uh, off in one corner, we had what we had at one point thought were magic players. Yes. Because, but it turned out they were playing the brand new unmatched Robin Hood versus Bigfoot with the Bruce Lee expansion. Uh, and we even had some Harry Potter Funko Pop getting played there. It was a busy and fantastic weekend for games. Yeah, and that's how you encountered the card games. There were people playing magic. There were yeah. people playing Yu-Gi-Oh! I saw at least. There was a group that were painting miniatures for War Machine. Uh, we also had some RPGs going on as well. Yep. And uh, Anchi Games got in a round of uh, Bang the Dice game. Yep. Uh, since Neil was cool enough to teach Deanna and I Teo to walk in, I felt I should pay him back. And I did so by teaching him Gentis with uh, the Deluxified Edition I've got. I know that's a game he's been really curious about. He did not back the Kickstarter and I think I was just trying to get a little dig in there and try to make him feel even worse for not backing the Kickstarter because I knew this is the kind of game Neil digs, right? So besides the fact that he's into heavy games, right, the weight, and he's going to dig the mechanics and he's going to dig the way it looks, he is also a classics major who does archaeology for a living. He actually goes to dig sites. And here's a game about pre-classic civilization. So I knew I, I right here, Neil's wheel, wheelhouse. I'm like, here's a game for Neil. Uh, we played a four-player game. Uh, it took us under two hours, including teaching the game. Besides Neil, the other players had played before, so that was good. Uh, Neil, being an experienced gamer, picked up the rules really well. Uh, man, this was a tight game. Like, this was a group of heavy gamers sitting down to play a heavy game, and we all gave it our best. Um, cheat jars were there for the event. If that had shown up on the table, I think someone would have slapped someone putting a cheat jar in front of us. It was not that kind of nut, nut game for us. Um, the final scores were literally within five points of each other. 
And the winner was up in the air until the final scoring. And it wasn't until the final scoring of Civilization cards in hand that swung the victory. Because one of the players had a six-point card that they couldn't finish, which means they lost three points. Whereas I had a 12-point card in my hand that I could finish, so it scored me six. It's a kind of ticket-to-ride kind of scoring system at the end. And literally, like, it's like, oh, you've won. Oh, you have to take that penalty. Oh, you've won. Oh, wait, you have an hour. Left. Oh, wait, I've got this card in my hand. Like, it was that close between all the players. That was a really enjoyable game. Had a great time. And, of course, Neil loved it as well, which I expected. And actually, he sent me a message today on Facebook saying he found a copy from someone in London, Ontario, and he's going to pick it up this weekend. <laughs> so that definitely did what it was supposed to do. Now, I got to say, though, playing Dead Man's Cabal, followed by Gent or Teotihuacan, followed by Gentis, with a bunch of players who dig heavier games, was overall highlight for Saturday. Like, it's not often I get to sit down, not have to worry about taking too long, not having to worry about the event ending, knowing that I have 12 hours, and being able to play longer, more brain-burning games with equally qualified players, equally good players. Oh, man, that was nice. So I got to say, when Gentis ended, I was quite burnt out. <laughs> well, you did do back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back heavy yeah. games. So it would be hard not to be a bit fried after that. Now, while you were off enjoying Deluxified Editions, uh, I finally got to get in a little bit of gaming as Dee brought over Gokuku and introduced me to the <laughs> wonders of this ABBA game. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got a couple of games in, and I have to say, we were getting pretty exploratory with our stick placement. <laughs> Spreading far and wide from the uh, supporting can. I saw pictures of that game. That was the widest nest <laughs> I have ever seen. Now, for me too, like you were playing Goku after after Gentis, I'm like, I'm done. I need I need light games. Uh, that's when I took the time to set up a crazy pitch card track. Uh, I finally got to use some of my long straightaway expansion pieces because I'd never used those before, and I got to use the jump from the pitch card extension pack one. Um, I actually took two separate tables and had a gap between them with the long piece and the jump hooking it together. And I gotta say, it looked awesome and it sounded great in theory, but as Sean can attest, it was a little harder to actually make that jump than I had attended. Uh, the three of us that played had fun, but I gotta say, uh, we ended up getting our steps in and I think I probably did a thousand squats picking up my pieces on the floor after failed jump and failed jump and failed jump. Now, while I was familiar with Pitch Car, I think most people have you know heard of it, especially if you listen mm -hmm. to this podcast. I've never actually played the game before, and I was surprised at just how many and varied techniques there are that are mm -hmm. both possible and sometimes required to circumnavigate the different aspects of the track. Uh, unfortunately, though, as we mentioned, the initial design was a bit overeager, yeah. uh, and there were two separate aspects that stopped each one of us dead at one point or another during the game for significant periods of time. Uh, both both the hill upwards and mm -hmm. the jump uh, proved to be significantly more difficult than I think anyone expected going in. Yeah, yeah. I tried a couple test flicks when I made the jump, and I don't know, I was lucky at the time or something, and it didn't seem that hard. But we totally should have instigated, uh, you know, after five flicks, you just make it rule or something like that or really i just started with a simple track but i wanted to show it off and i was actually really hoping to get the table of rpg players over to play but they they man they were giving sean a lot of feedback which is good for sean he was running a play test but i kept thinking i'll set this up and i'll get all those guys and we'll play 10 players because you can play pitch card 10 players and that and was that sean that hamilton happen. not sean yes hamilton. <laughs> true <laughs> uh last game i played of the night uh was go cuckoo uh I'm burnt out. I'm tired. I was about to go home, but then Ryan, I think was his name. I apologize if I got that wrong. Someone who showed up to one of our easy mode events for the first time in the last week had shown up and he had heard about the game and he had asked to play it. So I sat down and played a two player game with Ryan and that was pretty cool. He came out to support us just for extra life. And of course, Ryan loved it because everyone, seriously, I still, I can't. Uh, Go Cuckoo's been played multiple times for the event even played it i've yet to find a single person who doesn't like this game like i'm not trying to like brag or whatever but like seriously i can't find someone who doesn't like this like for me though it was great that was the perfect cap to the great day i'm like done i put i put a kiki cuckoo on the top of the nest i'm done <laughs> yeah now overall while it was a long day and yeah. on my end from the streaming side of things both fruitful and frustrating at various points for experimenting with the stream it was a great day of gaming and yeah. a nice warm map 
if not quite necessarily as financially beneficial for the charity as we had uh, hoped. Oh, we didn't do terrible. You know what? We made 200 bucks. We wouldn't have made if we weren't there. Yep. Now, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right. So for a change, there aren't any public play events I'm hosting for literally the next three weeks. So I'm hoping to get through some of the games I got at Origins. I've been distracted by easy mode events and breaking out old gateway games. I need to get back to playing some of the games I brought home. So uh, this is going to mean people are going to expect a bunch of unboxing videos coming up, uh, including one here that uh, my friend Mike Murphy recently got a Kickstarter of Zombicide. Oh, my God. Zombicide of Vader, which is in this box, which weighs 55 pounds. Uh, that got dropped off on his doorstep last week. And he got a hold of me and he's like, hey, do you want to unbox it? And I'm like, you know what? I know that's hot. That's hot off Kickstarter. It's miniatures. It's cool mini. It's going to look cool. So I am hoping to get this unboxed in the next couple of days. All right. And there's also a chance we might get in some more streaming online play. Yes. So keep your Twitch notifications turned on and you might get to see some of the digital versions of board games getting streamed live on the channel right here. Yeah, our Twitch stream, this is uh, this, uh, a pre-warm up. We might even be trying it tomorrow. We may have stuff going on Thursday nights going forward. All right. Uh, so coming back into the lobby. Uh, we've got a bunch of uh, chatter about uh, what happened uh, on the weekend. Uh, D points out uh, that she played the Bang the Dice game. Uh, mm -hmm. Your kids also got in a little bit of uh, King on the Dice. King, King of the, the Dice. dice. Yep. Uh, and, and again, yes, they also so, played Go Cuckoo. Yeah, so much Go Cuckoo. So much Go Cuckoo going on. Uh, I think once uh, D got out of the way of uh, Teo to walk in, uh, she, <laughs> she was already burned out. So she went, uh, she just started wandering around with uh, Cuckoo's Nest. For everyone to play. Yeah, uh, I, I feel bad Kevin still has yet to play Go Cuckoo. It's like we're teasing him with it. <laughs> At some point, I I'll, I usually bring it out. I'll definitely every easy mode, I'm going to bring it for sure. We'll see at the, the CG Realm nights. Maybe, maybe not. Yep. I, I We're going to have to make it a RPG rules for it. It'd, it'd be like a version of Dread. And then uh, jumping back a little bit to uh, just after we uh, left the lobby last time, uh, people were talking about the consignment uh, and some of the mm -hmm. risks. I guess they're... Uh, one store, the uh, owner had changed hands and the old owner had kept no records of what had been taken in for consignment. So people kind of got burned. It's, 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 it can really be a risk on both parties, both the person, uh, you know, putting things in for consignment and the store if it's not handled properly. So, uh, you know, do, do be careful and make sure that everything's being recorded properly if you are working in consignment. I just, I don't know, I, I'm, maybe even I'm oversimplifying it, but I'm thinking like just an Excel spreadsheet that says the name of the person, the game, the price they want. Like it's that, just, that, that it really then, is all it, it takes, but you have to. And then, and then like a, a formula that takes 10% <laughs> of that or whatever for the store, or two bucks or whatever, right? Like, but I, you have I'm to, well. you have to take that effort and some, you know, some people just aren't willing to. Yeah, oh. there, were, there was lots of ice cream had at the, the event. Uh, the baked goods, man. The baked goods from from Coffee Exchange. Thumbs up, Ron. Damn. Yeah. Like okay. I, I was expecting some cookies. Like, oof. yeah. And cool. then, uh, yeah, Angie Games is saying, you know, person who says it says it has all the pieces, and the other person says it doesn't. We had uh, there was a, a problem last year with the auction, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, things you know that appeared to not be correct, but you know it was after the fact, so. Uh, there were some yeah, hard feelings after some. that. I, I guess it's easier just not to do it. Plus, I, plus it's a game store, right? They make more money selling new games. So Absolutely. maybe they just don't want us in there with our used stuff. Yep. I just wish it was an easier way to get rid of games than to get cheap games. But of course, everyone kind of feels that way, right? Well, at least you've got extra life once a year. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's one way I purge my collection. Right now, I need money myself, unfortunately. So the extra life donations this year are not going to be as big as the last previous years. All right. And now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Joe Swick, oh, thank you. Jeff Seuss, missed you at the Extra Life event, sorry you couldn't make it out. William Fisher, thanks. Daniel Thomas, glad to see you on the Discord server now. Wayne, the Star Wars guy, Humphrey. And Tinny. 
No, see, I, I messed up because it was at the bottom. It said Houdini. Uh, it's a it's a it's a Jawa thing. Ah, uh, okay. Because we're, we're pretty sure Wayne is just a bunch of Jawas in the oh. outfit. Fair enough. Well, Lidar, that was the double question. bell. Oh. My bad. <laughs> we'll get to you in a minute, Zwedar. <laughs> well, that was the double bell. This means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Sorry. <laughs> if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also catch the Tabletop's bell... Uh, you can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30 we mostly play Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the Pet House Suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.